but let's get started. Um, my name's Owen Atkin. I'm the director of the Centre for Entrepreneurial Agri-Technology, um, which is an ANU Innovation Institute. Innovation Institutes are sort of a vehicle by which the university can harness the full interdisciplinary capability of the university to address complex challenges out in society and industry. Now, you couldn't think of more sort of complex challenges that will be facing us right now than some of the food security issues that are the planet's going through, geopolitical war, climate change, and so on, all affecting the supply of food. And there's obviously the technological issue as well in terms of how our, our ability to improve productivity growth of crops. So in that sort of context of understanding external challenges and so on, uh, CIAT's been running a sort of series of conversations through the year uh, within sort of spaces like this to understand the nature of those complex issues so we can best work out how the university and its partners such as CSIRO can address those issues. Um, and also we form networks and one of those network sort of structures is having innovation fellows. And Alison Bentley, um, Dr. Alison Bentley, who's here today, is one of those uh, innovation fellows that we've established. Um, and in that case with Alison, she gives us a reach into an understanding about how the global community is dealing with food security issues and the provision of seed, particularly to developing countries around the world, to make sure that they've got the latest, best climate ready type seed in order to plant. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Alison in a moment, um, but before we get to that, um, uh, just in, in introduction to her there, she is the director of the Global Wheat Program um, at CIMIT in Mexico and is kindly spending a full week here and has been very busy. I think on the day you arrived, you had to do an inter three interviews on the day that you got off the plane and then go to the dinner over at the Crawford meeting and then give a talk the next day, but first being woken up for another interview by radio. So Alison's been super busy on the day that she's here, but she is here until early next week. Um, if there's anyone that would really like to have a chat with her about some of the things that you hear today, uh, we might be able to find a spot in the calendar. Um, so do reach out to the SEAT team. The last thing I'd like to point out about SEAT is we have a monthly newsletter and that newsletter uh, is an opportunity for you to learn more about what we do um, and so all you need to do is go to the SEAT website and you'll be able to find out um, how to do that. So Alex Sloan has kindly agreed to be our MC for today, um, a very experienced journalist, so I'll pass over to you. Thanks so much Owen. Um, I am delighted to be with you this afternoon and um, yes, I actually started life in ABC Radio as a rural journalist. I came from a farm and I worked in um, Papua New Guinea for a couple of years, Australian volunteer abroad, actually producing food, trying to produce food. So a little tiny bit of experience compared to all of you this afternoon. Um, I'd like to acknowledge we're on Ngunnawal Ngambri country, land that was never ceded, and thank our First Peoples for their past and ongoing custodianship of this land and that custodianship and the health of country is directly linked to what we're going to be discussing today, just in terms of housekeeping. If you can keep your masks on, thank you so much. It's ANU policy to, to keep them on. I know it's hot, but um, thanks for that. And also just make sure your phones are on silent. And if some people come in, there are still some... Um, seats at the front here, so just direct them up to the front. So very soon the keynote address, as we've heard, will be delivered by Dr. Alison Bentley, SEAT Fellow and Director of the Global Wheat Program, um, where she leads a team of international scientists developing the and delivering new tools and technology to improve plant breeding and crop production. Dr. Bentley's address will then be followed by discussion with a really fantastic panel. Um, we have Professor Mark Howden, uh, climate scientist, um, health and equity professor, Sharon Friel, and crop researcher with ACR, Dr. Eric Hutner. Um, and there will also be time. So we'll have a discussion for about 25 minutes and then there's time for your questions as well. So just store up your questions, even write notes. And I'd like you right out of the box because the time is quite tight this afternoon. But now to our keynote address. And as you've heard, Dr. Alison Bentley is the director of the Global Wheat Program. Her research combines genetics and genomics to develop and deliver new tools and technology to improve plant breeding and crop production. And she leads a team of international scientists uh, developing improved wheat germ germoplasm. And prior to uh, joining CIMIT, which was in November 2020, 
She was working in the United Kingdom focused on translation of fundamental scientific breakthroughs into tangible impacts for the agri-food sector. She has a doctorate in agricultural science and a PhD in agriculture from the University of Sydney. It's very, very lovely to have her back in the country and please welcome Dr. Alison Bentley. Oh, I've got one, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alex, and thank you everyone for uh, being here today. So I'm going to talk uh, about our cereal foods production system uh, and wheat in particular. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the importance of shockproofing uh, wheat for the future. Uh, so wheat is eaten by 2.5 billion people globally. So it's a really important in the context of global food security. The Ukraine-Russia war has also shown us the importance of wheat geopolitically, uh, something we may have not been had at the front of our minds. It's also important that wheat, we remember that wheat is a foundational part of many of our agricultural systems, including here in Australia. And in our agricultural systems, we have to ask what's the role of wheat, what's the role of national, uh, regional uh, and international governments in ensuring wheat is produced for food security, but also to stabilize our global markets. So Alec, as Alex mentioned, uh, I'll give a presentation uh, and then we'll have a really fascinating panel discussion to, to dive into some of these, uh, these issues. So why wheat? Uh, my title indicates staple cereals, and there are a number of staple cereals, wheat, rice, uh, maize, that really sustain a large proportion of the population. Uh, and of those, wheat is, is really key. Uh, and this map here shows the countries in red are the countries in the world where wheat is the number one provider of daily energy for the population. So you can see a lot of red on this map, uh, and that really indicates the role of wheat uh, in stabilizing uh, food supply and food security. Uh, and many of the countries where wheat predominates are in the global south and the developing world. So wheat is really this important mechanism to alleviate global hunger. So then why wheat, as well as this source of, of uh, dietary uh, needs and food supply for much of the world's population, wheat is also incredibly versatile. So I'm sure many of us here have eaten wheat uh, today. So we have this, what looks like a relatively simple grain growing in a field, a, 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 everyone's seen a, a field of wheat, I'm sure. Uh, but the wheat that we grow in the field provides many different complex products uh, to us in our daily lives. So you may not, yeah, even for those people who don't eat wheat, uh, it's likely you eat something that might eat wheat. So we really have wheat as this very simple uh, kind of thing from history, but that's uh, actually really a foundational part of not only our agricultural systems, but also our food systems. So when the price of wheat increases, it typically uh, translates to an increase in our household uh, in our household budgets, the cost to us as consumers. Uh, and, and in this part of the world, maybe it's a cost that we can each absorb personally. But when we look across the world and the different income levels that exist in different parts of the world, these rising food prices can have really dramatic and significant uh, impacts on the livelihoods of communities. So in my title, I talk about shockproof staples. Uh, and this is because we see more than ever uh, multiplying challenges impacting our food system, our ability to produce food, our ability to supply food equitably uh, to the populations that, that need them. Uh, and these are multifaceted challenges. Uh, the Ukraine-Russia war has really had wheat at the forefront because of the impacts on wheat supply. And I'll talk about that uh, a little bit more. But on top of this, we see growing uh, growing reliance on food aid, so the, the need for people to be provided with their basic staple foodstuffs because they can't be produced or made available at a high enough uh, at a high enough rate to, to meet the demands. Then we see the nitrogen, the inputs into our agricultural systems becoming much less available or much more expensive. So we, we struggle to produce the same amount of crop uh, and d deliver that in a sustainable way. Uh, and then we also see uh, heat and climate effects amplifying the, the already 
constrained agricultural productivity. Uh, and then a lot of social pressures as well, and a really interesting framework around that in terms of how societies are changing, how our populations are urbanizing, and what that means for the changes in the food uh, that we eat uh, and that populations around uh, the world eat. So, so really we have this, this multifaceted challenge that's not going to be addressed by any single biological, genetic, agronomic policy intervention. And we really need a coming together uh, of all of these different disciplines to, to think about how we de deliver a more resilient agricultural system and a more resilience, particularly uh, in my case, in, in the wheat system. So complexity and frequency of food price rises. Uh, I think we, we see these spikes and we call them spikes and say, okay, that was a food price spike. Uh, and, and then these food price spikes start happening at reoccurring frequency. So we can see here, we've got the 2008 price rises where the price of cereals, uh, the price of oils, and the, therefore the food price index, which is very closely linked to this, uh, went up. Again, we saw that uh, in 2011. And again, we're seeing that now as an impact of the Ukraine-Russia uh, Russia war. We can also see that if you look at the food price index, so this is the cost for people to buy food, it's very closely linked to the price of cereals. So we really, again, see this fundamental link between the cost of wheat, uh, rice and maize, our, our basic cereals, and the overall cost to a consumer of the food that they eat and the food that's necessary to sustain them. And what we know from previous food price spikes is they often lead to civil unrest, particularly in areas of vulnerability in the world uh, where food insecurity is the highest. So we saw this with the Arab Spring uh, and also with a lot of uh, civil unrest in Africa in 2011. Uh, and this really raises the question when we start to see uh, in the current situation these really high prices, what is really the, impl the impact for our greater society uh, so that's why wheat in the context of this societal uh, challenge it, it is hugely relevant. So what did we see in the wake of the Ukraine-Russia war and why is wheat uh, really a key part of this? So directly after the invasion of the Ukraine, wheat prices uh, skyrocketed uh, and have been highly uh, volatile since then. Uh, and when the price goes up, the supply changes. And so we've seen a real constriction in the supply of wheat that was available in the global market. This creates vulnerability uh, in, this, in the availability and the, uh, the ability of people to buy wheat uh, on the open market. Uh, and this brings this potential for instability uh, in, in society uh, as well. In addition, many of the governments in the, in the global south, in the developing world, subsidize the price of bread. So this in introduces additional costs on the governments of these countries. Uh, and we've been really highlighting that most of these impacts are inequitably felt. So by low and middle income, cons low and middle income countries with insufficient access to foreign exchange, US dollars to buy wheat at elevated prices, these impacts are really magnified on those communities. And then we see this is not just one part. We see this, this change in supply and demand. We see recent heat waves, uh, reduced North American yields, uh, limited access to fertilizer components, which also come out of Russia. Uh, and these are really all kind of magnifying components of, of an impending food crisis. I think in the Australian context, there's, there's also the question of the, the recent bumper yields. So Australia is one of the only countries seeing really high levels of wheat productivity this year. Uh, and this also raises some really interesting questions. What's the role of Australia? What's the role of, of a country that has a bumper year in a time when prices are really high and supply is really low? What's the social and uh, economic and, and policy direction that you take, uh, take with that? And how does that play as, as global citizens uh, in, in ensuring this food security, geopolitical uh, stability? So we've been doing a lot of work at CIMIT to really try and highlight the importance of wheat as a source of food, particularly for vulnerable communities in the global south, uh, as well as the inequalities that are coming about due to the current crisis. So we see these inequalities not only at the level of a country not able to access wheat, but also at the level of a household. Uh, and we know, for example, that women have a tendency to personally absorb food uh, deficits in food. Uh, and so we really see this 
inequalities across uh, scales from the household where decision making, income levels change, uh, the dynamics of how food's available, through to countries and regions uh, entering really uh, significant and severe food insecurity. Uh, and through our program, which operates with a mandate for, to provide wheat uh, for the global south, we're able to start new work really rapidly, uh, in this case in East Africa, uh, to really look at how we address some of these issues on the ground. Uh, and this is really uh, important. So if we just look back a little bit at why we're in this current situation, why the invasion of Ukraine by Russia uh, led to this increasing, uh, th these increasing price, uh, the price of global wheat. Uh, and what we can see is over the past 10 years, we've had a real concentration of supply of wheat into the global market. Uh, and the picture at the top shows the exporting countries. And you can only see a few bits of red color here. So there's five countries in the world that supply almost, that supply a, a very large proportion of the world's wheat. And this includes both Russia and Ukraine. So if you take those two countries out of the equation of providing grain, uh, then you start to have serious problems. Uh, and if North America then yields at, at, at very low levels, you start to compound this uh, with another stress on the system. We also know that many of the countries that import wheat, so import the wheat from Ukraine and Russia, are in the global south uh, and are therefore uh, particularly impacted by this inability uh, to purchase the wheat that they've been purchasing uh, to date. Uh, and I wanted to talk a little bit about concentration of supply because I think we don't only see it in the agricultural sector, we don't just see it in wheat itself. So in many parts of the many different industries, we see a concentration of supply. Uh, and this is just an example of concentration of our retail buying. You know, we, we used to potentially go to five or six stores to look for our Christmas presents and online retailings are now allowed us to go to just one place which is able to provide for all our needs. So this is, this is uh, similar and different in many ways, but kind of indicates how we've really moved many parts of our, our industries and our supply chains into really concentrated supply. And we know what this looks like in terms of the retail environment. So we now all have the convenience of clicking on a button and having a centralized source of supply of, our, of all the consumer, uh, consumer goods we could demand. Uh, but this has implications for the resilience of our retail sector. Uh, and this is, uh, this is similar in some ways uh, to the case of wheat. Uh, and then when something's out of stock, suddenly we have no options. Uh, and this is really kind of uh, very similar to what we see uh, in wheat, but also in the, in the microelectronics, so the very similar um, case here with, with the concentration of supply, which now has really significant impacts because we've introduced these vulnerabilities into our system. Uh, and if we look at the trends over time uh, and across the world, we see that these, again, are unequal uh, impacts. So if we look at Africa and Asia and the reliance on cereal imports into these countries, we can see that these have been growing over time. So becoming more and more reliance on the availability of imported cereals. Uh, and this is really significant because again, uh, if you're in Europe, potentially it's not such a problem, but if you're in Africa, your reliance on other people to provide uh, a source of imports uh, is quite significant. It's also important, as I mentioned uh, at the start, that we see kind of shifts in the patterns of consumption of our basic cereal crops. Uh, and this graph here shows the, the difference between uh, wheat production in Africa and the demand for wheat. So growing urbanization in Africa has really accelerated the demand for wheat uh, as more urbanized, and a lot of evidence suggests that more urbanized populations have changes in food preferences. And here we see a shift uh, to more wheat-based diets. And at the same time, production is staying stable or even reducing uh, in some countries. So this gap between what a country or a region can produce and what it demands grows over time, really amplifying this need to, to have a source and availability uh, of imports. And as I mentioned, uh, in places like East Africa, this is becoming really significant. So if you're in Kenya at the port of Mombasa, this is the import 
this is the intake point for, for grain into East Africa, where you have very large tankers of grain available on your one-click Amazon analog, essentially. So a boat will come, unload in the port. You have a highly sophisticated port infrastructure that's ready to take that cheap grain from Ukraine and Russia, process it, uh, and convert it into food uh, supporting the populations and the demand that exists. Uh, and we see this in the mills in East Africa as well, where there's up to 60% reliance on, on wheat, cheap wheat imported at the when it's needed, just on time delivery into the ports, into the infrastructure that exists uh, and ready to be available in the flour that's produced. So this is a really significant challenge because if 60% of your wheat your flour components are not available, uh, if there are no boats available to come into this port, then, then you really start to see some of the practical and real-time food security uh, implications of the current crisis. So we've been trying to develop packages uh, to address the short, medium and long-term uh, implications uh, and potential to, to mitigate these. Uh, and I'll just talk about these uh, in, a, in a few details. So in the short term, obviously, we need to secure access to, to grain, uh, particularly for the most vulnerable populations. Uh, and we propose uh, boosting of production is obviously a, one way to do this, uh, as well as ensuring access through market controls, making sure grain's available for human consumption and that it's distributed uh, equitably and that food aid programs can deliver the, the aid that, that's, that's needed in, as a very short-term uh, mechanism, uh, as well as securing supply, and I'll talk about that uh, a little bit. In the medium term, we look to targeting the expansion of wheat production uh, in particular uh, and building self-sufficiency pathways. Many countries uh, want to be able to produce the wheat uh, that's grown either in that local or regional uh, area, uh, as well as monitoring, which I'll, I'll talk about in more, more detail. Uh, and then the longer term, we obviously need to think about things like expansion and productivity within the agroecological boundaries of our systems. I think many of us know or will have read about the fragility of our agricultural production and our natural environment, uh, and really about designing systems that can balance those two demands of, of having healthy environments as well as having a sustainable food production for our populations. We also see a, re a really big need to address the gender disparities that exist particularly in cereal crop production uh, and in our agricultural systems uh, in general. Uh, and then increasing investment. We were at the Crawford Fund conference this week and this, this topic came up time and time again. Agriculture takes a long time. There's a long lead in time. Food production is really a foundation of society, yet we invest in it in one, two, three year chunks of time. Uh, and, then, and then we look at how we do that. Uh, and really develop a strategy for the, the resilience of our food systems. So this is obviously uh, an, an easy thing to say, uh, but a very, thing, a very difficult thing uh, to do in practice. So first, if we look at boosting production, it's easy to say, right, we can just produce more wheat on the same land area. Uh, and, and that would be great. Uh, and that's really what we're proposing here, because if we look at the productivity of wheat, uh, around the world, which is what's shown here, you can see that wheat can be grown in a lot of places, and it is grown uh, in lots of places. It's one of the few crops that can be grown across such a wide eco-geographical range. We also know from crop modeling data that most of the world's wheat production is below the theoretical the theoretical maximum that, that is possible to be achieved. So, uh, and this is shown by the, the red and orange uh, points in this this map. So even in Australia, we can see that productivity uh, is below the theoretical maximum. Uh, and in, in some of the bread baskets of the world, so the northern parts of India, for example, we can really do more to increase the productivity. Uh, and increasing productivity is obviously not as easy to do as saying increase productivity, but we know a lot about the biology of the system. We know a lot about the physiology of the crop. We know how to apply. Uh, we know how to mechanize. We know how to apply uh, inputs at the right time, uh, and it's really about putting all of these things together uh, and making sure they're available. Challenging to do, uh, but theoretically possible to boost production in these regions. 
We're also as part of this, and, and this is a really core cool part of what we do at CIMIT in Mexico, is about accelerating the development of new germplasm, new varieties that can perform better uh, at scale. Uh, and so this is some of our, our new infrastructure that we have in Mexico, where we can, can really supercharge the breeding process uh, even further to, to produce material and get it out to farmers uh, and producers even more quickly. In terms of securing supply, one of the current uh, areas of work that we're currently exploring is the ability to blend wheat flour with the flowers of other cereals uh, that are available in a local area. So in this case, in East Africa, can we take just a small proportion of the wheat flour, so two to 5%, which doesn't sound like much if it's a one kilo bag of flour, but if it's a ton silo of, of wheat grain, uh, and blend that with millets and sorghums and, and develop products that are not rejected by the consumer. Uh, and this is a way to reduce uh, the amount of wheat that's needed really at a scale uh, that, that's potential. Uh, and so this is new work that started to, to really explore the potential for both utilizing uh, flowers that are available, whether they be cassava, uh, sorghum, millets, uh, and blending them to reduce the amount of wheat that's required uh, to provide the, the need to the needs of the consumer. Then if we look at self-sufficiency pathways, much like the, the map of, of boosting production, we can see uh, in this view of the globe, the level of self-sufficiency uh, in many of the wheat systems, uh, particularly in the global south. And this level of self-sufficiency is very low. Uh, and again, we have biological agronomic uh, solutions uh, and we really propose to, to try and really get those out to people uh, much faster. In terms of monitoring capacity, this is a really interesting area of work to say, can we take snapshots of the world at any one time uh, and know what productivity looks like? Because vulnerabilities exist when you only know what's happening in your backyard and you don't know what's happening in the rest of the world. Uh, so NASA Harvest have, have really pioneered this, being able to monitor crops uh, across the globe and identify where vulnerabilities uh, exist. Uh, and this is just one example that was uh, from the February data, uh, which starts to give warnings of, of different factors, biophysical factors like drought, uh, as well as different, uh, different uh, geopolitical things like conflict. So to be able to kind of capture and share this data in real time, to know where in the world wheat's going to be produced this season, what are the risks, who's monitoring them, how do we mitigate them, how do governments use this, how does the market use this information uh, to respond? Another component of monitoring capacity uh, is to say, could we use some of the technologies that we already have available to ensure that we move wheat around the world in a safe way? So wheat has a number of pests and pathogens that, that reduce yield. And what we don't want to do by starting to say, let's move wheat in different ways around the world, let's produce it in different areas, uh, is start new pandemics or epidemics of wheat diseases. Uh, and we saw this risk when uh, there was announced that, you, you know, new countries, countries were looking at where to buy wheat and, and countries that had never imported from different regions because of the, the biosecurity risk said, well, we need the grain, so we're going to import. Uh, and this introduces a longer term risk if you import grain and then some of that uh, isn't, some of that has a biosecurity threat, then there's potential to, to create even bigger problems uh, in the future. But we're now very good at genomics. Where everyone knows what a PCR is. Everyone's done a COVID PCR test before they travel. The world now has access to thousands of PCR machines spread out all around the world. So what if we could turn all of those into seed testing facilities? What if we could say, okay, we don't probably don't need our COVID PCR testing labs anymore. Let's use those to test grain agricultural products that move around the world uh, and use the power of genomics, which we now have to understand that that seed is clean and that seed can move, uh, either be exported or be imported uh, into a country. So we really think there's potential to use available technologies uh, and, and make these available for monitoring the capacity in our systems. And then I wanted to talk briefly about the climate change amplifiers that exist. So we've seen in the current situation a real geopolitical shift uh, that's had a big impact on the market, uh, on, the, on the grain market. But at the same time, we see also the real-time effects of climate change uh, on wheat production. 
Uh, and, and we talked before about inequalities. And again, with climate change, we see a very similar picture. Uh, and this map on the top shows the areas of the world uh, in 2050, so the wheat producing areas of the world, where we expect to see yield increases as a result of climate change or yield decreases. Uh, and you can probably notice that the, light, the, the blue and green colors are mostly in the global north where we expect yields to stay the same. Production will shift potentially in geographical area, uh, but yields are, will stay the same or even increase. Yet if we look in the global south, uh, the bread baskets in, in northern India, also in Australia, we see a big expectation that climate change effects will seriously uh, reduce uh, yields. So we know a large proportion of the forecast yield decreases will be in the global south, uh, again bringing this burden uh, of climate impacts into wheat uh, and really being important when we think about strategies to stabilize wheat. Where do we expect to see the greatest impacts of climate change? What can we do in those regions to, to be ahead of those changes? And at CIMIT, we work a lot on the upstream understanding of heat and drought stress response. How do we develop these varieties uh, for the future? And this is just a small component of how we uh, address the fragility of our cropping systems in the face of climate change. Uh, and this was really brought home in the current season. So we already had the impacts of the Ukraine-Russia war on global wheat. Uh, and India and Pakistan, South Asia had forecast to have record yields. And everyone was saying, that's great. You know, it's, it's good that someone has record yields. You know, the potential for that to, to fill export gaps is great. Uh, but then just at the end of the season, we saw really significant uh, century high uh, heat waves across northern India, uh, Pakistan, which, which led to very significant reductions uh, in the yield that was forecast for those countries. Uh, and this led to an immediate shock again in the market. So we already had a real constriction of supply. We were expecting more grains to be produced. Uh, it wasn't produced. Uh, and then the market again went into, into turmoil as a result of this. Uh, and this is really happening now. And I think that's key, that these are things that are happening in real time. We talk a lot about climate change as a existent, I think still as an existential threat. Uh, in some respects. But here we see really the impacts from one day to the next on, on a very significant uh, heat wave. We've also been uh, arguing that we need to focus on, on rural communities and the health of rural communities who produce the wheat that we're expecting uh, to adapt to the future in hotter and drier environments. Uh, and I think this is a really important component to consider that wheat needs people to produce it, to harvest it, to process the grain. And we're expecting wheat to perform in hotter environments, but we're also expecting our rural labor force to be able to work and live in these more unfavorable environments. Uh, and I think it's really important that we, we consider all of these factors uh, when we think about the impacts of climate change on our wheat production, both as a, as a biological thing, we want grain, uh, but we also want a rural labor force that's able to, to produce and, and have uh, healthy uh, and, and, and strong livelihoods. So in the CIMIT program, uh, we're trying to accelerate our biological uh, and genetic uh, offer to the world in terms of improved wheat germplasm that can, can grow and thrive around the world. Uh, and the program, Norman Borlaug, who, who was the first wheat director uh, and won the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, accelerated the breeding process to deliver better material to farmers in South Asia in particular uh, faster. And he did this by using the ge geography of Mexico to move material and achieve two breeding cycles uh, a year. So this allowed the development of new varieties, uh, which were taken up uh, by farmers. Now at CIMIT in our program, we're, we're trying to use artificial environments, controlled conditions to accelerate this breeding process even further, uh, and, and really trying to shorten the time that it takes to get genetic innovations, exciting research bundled into a seed that can be grown in a farmer's field. We're also looking at the seed system. So we can, can we accelerate both the breeding but also the delivery of that improved seed into a farmer's field. Because it's not enough to just develop a new variety, it has to actually be grown in the field in order to deliver something uh, in terms of uh, a livelihood impact. Uh, and in this process, this is trying to reduce this time as much as possible. Uh, we're thinking about some 
really interesting uh, and new areas uh, of work. And here at SEAT, as part of my innovation fellowship, one of the topics we're looking at is the development of the COVID-19 vaccine. So if you know anything about vaccine development, uh, and many of us, I'm sure, didn't know much before COVID happened, the vaccine development process takes 10 years, typically 10 to 12 years. But in COVID-19, we saw that the process took a year. Uh, and this was, there were many factors which led to this, the, the obvious demand for it, the, the, the ability to invest lots of money, the open sharing of data, novel ways to generate and analyze data, and then the regulatory ch the pr changes to the regulatory process, which allowed it to be, be so quick. Uh, and now the aspiration is that that process could take 100 days. So that's phenomenal. We've gone from a 10-year process of producing a vaccine to an aspiration of 100 days. So that's really changed the game uh, in terms of, of what's been able to be done in the vaccine development process. If we look at the development of a seed variety, it also takes 10 years. So we're asking, what can we learn from this process? The parallelization of all of these different processes that enabled uh, something that took 10 years before to now take 100 days. Can we use that uh, and any of that learning to enable us to produce seed varieties quicker? So what if seeds were vaccines? Can we apply these, these learnings? Can we apply the regulatory process changes uh, to deliver seed faster? Uh, to farmers and really important in this space to, to have the ability to work across disciplines and to learn from different sectors uh, in terms of innovation. We're also interested, I think maybe Owen less so, in the use of novel financial and, and digital tools for moving seed, uh, particularly in hard to reach areas. So we worked for a long time in Afghanistan where it's very difficult to get new seed physically to farmers. There's not a formal seed sector which allows you to, to distribute it to a store, people to go to a store, you collect the data, you know how many people bought that bag of seed in that area and you can really nicely aggregate your market share information and provide statistics on that. So really looking, are there technologies that we can use that don't require us to know the full chain, that, that don't require us to know every piece of information along the way, but to use some of these different technologies now available uh, to, to understand and to move uh, material. So just to come to a close before the panel discussion, I think it's really important that we we really recognize that our cereal food production systems and most of our systems, our retail system, our microprocessor system, uh, have really a lot of vulnerabilities within them. They have not only biological or technological uh, challenges or vulnerabilities, but also uh, geopolitical uh, challenges within them. So wheat is, is really important because it's, it's crucial for the alleviation of hunger. It's eaten by a lot of people. Uh, and a lot of people in the global south. When we see increasing costs, we see great food insecurity, but also an impact on consumers in terms of the cost of living, uh, if, even here in Australia. Uh, the, current, the current crisis was really this dependence on a concentrated source of supply, uh, and we are trying to propose some applied solutions to, to address this in future. Uh, and we see these amplifiers particularly uh, in this case of climate change having a significant uh, impact. Uh, and really excited because we also have technology. We have probably the most access to technology that we've ever had uh, and the ability to harness this uh, and apply it to, to, the, to develop applied solutions. So with that, I'll close. Thank you very much uh, and hand back to, to Alex. Thank you. <laughs> Um, well, I don't know about you, <laughs> my mind is reeling. So that was just absolutely fascinating, terrifying, but I think shot through with hope about there are solutions. And um, Alison's just given fast food a whole new meaning. Um, if we can look at the COVID vaccine in relation to food, that really is fastening things up. So if I could get Alison to come and sit down now, and then I'll invite up the panel. 
Um, we've got a fantastic panel for you this afternoon. Professor Mark Howden, up you come. Mark is the Director of the Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions at the ANU. He's Vice Chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, and is Chair of the ACT Climate Change Council. And Mark has worked on climate variability, climate change, innovation and adoption issues for over 30 years in partnerships with many industries, community and policy groups by both research and science policy roles. Issues he's addressed include agriculture and food security, the natural resource base, ecosystems and biodiversity, energy, water and urban systems. Please welcome Professor Mark Howden. <laughs> Have you come. Professor Sharon Friel is Professor of Health Equity and Director of the Menzies Centre for Health Governance at the School of Regulation and Global Governance at the ANU and an ARC Laureate Fellow. Um, Sharon's interests are in the governance and regulatory processes relating to the structural factors affecting health inequities, including trade and investment, urbanisation, food systems and climate change. She's considered one of the foremost researchers internationally in the social determinants of health and was nominated in 2014 by her international peers as one of the world's most influential female leaders in global health. Please welcome Professor Sharon Friel. And Dr Eric Huttner, up you come, is Research Program Manager for Crops at ACR, the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research. He started his career in plant molecular genetics, working in public research institute INRA, INRA in France and has worked for more than 20 years in a range of private companies. He's also been involved in managing public private research initiatives in both Australia and France and was a founding partner and director of Australia's Cooperative Research Centre for Plant Science and a member of the Australian Biotechnology Advisory Council. He's a graduate of France's leading agricultural science school, the Institut National Agronomique. Just put up with me, Eric. Well <laughs> Please welcome Dr. <laughs> Eric Hutner. So, look, I think we first come to you, Alison. Thank you so much. And I was commenting to you, you know, as a, a Sydney, and I know some of your family's here this afternoon, so welcome to them. But what a fantastic high school to go that had a farm um, part of the school. This is why we've got you now. Mm -hmm. How fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, seeing is believing and the ability to to do something in practice and cut a potato into five and plant it and see a hundred potatoes grow. I mean, this is the the transformative power of, of food production. And I think that's really important as we think about training the next generation yeah. as well. So I just wonder how many schools now have that component and perhaps we should bring that back. Mm -hmm. But Alison... Um, as Australia's national university, what do you see as ANU's role in solving some of the challenge to global food security? Mm -hmm. And I know you're a fellow um, here at SEAT. You know, what can we do? I think, I think there's uh, probably three elements. And the first is about really the, the cutting edge of the science and, and innovation. Uh, and the Australian National University and, and other partners have really the ability to drive that innovation, whether it be blue sky thinking, thinking cross-disciplinary um, and really trying to harness the latest science that's available uh, and make it available, which, which is a crucial, crucial part of it, and make it available in a shorter time uh, as possible. I think the second element uh, and what part of what SEAT aims to do is also to develop some of the, the thinking around how we really uh, approach these challenges. So they might be an agricultural challenge that, that someone in a different discipline has never thought about, um, but the ability to kind of convene and bring together different minds and, and different ways of thinking, uh, whether they be from the policy space, from the biology space, from computing, I think that's a really uh, unique position to be able to do. And then, then the final part is about training the minds of the next generation and, and not just training in the, the traditional sense. Uh, I, I think really being able to use the, the full extent of what's available in the innovation landscape to, to shape the minds of tomorrow and, and really get those, those minds focused on, on some of these big societal challenges. So I think those three elements are, are really crucial to what ANU can provide. So to the ANU and, and see it is really quite well placed because it's it's small, it's got contact with, across the disciplines, is that? Exactly, yeah, I think that, that convening power, so you don't have to have all the individuals anymore sitting in one place, I think that's the, that's the beauty, right? You can, you can pull those people together 
uh, and really try and address some of these these on the face of it a biological challenge but let's let's put computing into that let's put let's put different lenses uh, into solving some of these these challenges mm. so to mark to you climate change and you know it's a tough one and i know you you constantly want us to stay positive and look to solutions climate climate change is highlighted as an amplifier of the current wheat crisis and is likely to continue to place significant pressure on global crop production at the same time agriculture is a significant source of emissions how do we address trade-offs in agriculture to achieve climate change targets while maintaining production to sustain trade and food it's a it's a juggle <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you can do it, Mark. <laughs> th th thanks, Alex, and, and thanks, Alison, for the presentation. That was great. Um, and, and for the work of you and your team that you're doing over, over there. Uh, it's, it's one of the fundamental challenges ahead of us. Um, uh, I, I actually think that in many ways the challenges of climate change are understated uh, by analyses such as uh, Alison showed up. Um, uh, and, and that's when you look at existing trends driven by climate change, they're actually much greater than most, uh, most of those models that the future analysis are, are based on would indicate. And amongst other things, uh, we, we see this increase in uh, climate variability at different scales, um, which is uh, you know, potentially driven by climate change, most likely driven by climate change. And that increase in variability by itself will, will throw challenges into the supply-demand equation, uh, but also um, increased variability reduces investment. And so increased risk um, drives down investment in future technologies, in investment in nitrogen fertiliser and similar things. And so, um, so I think the, the sort of compounding effect of climate change is actually uh, underestimated in, in our current assessments. And, and, and that itself, I think, is a real problem. You combine that with uh, the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, down, you know, going net zero by 2050 if we're to keep things to 1.5 degrees. And, uh, and when you look at our food systems generally, uh, you know, across the border, about 30% of our emissions globally. And so um, you, you see that uh, agriculture is a big part of the picture, um, both in terms of, uh, you know, being impacted by climate change, but also impacting on climate change. And, and so the way through this, I think, is uh, through um, being smarter about how we do things. So it's actually about um, looking for technology which generates improved yield under stress, you know, improved uh, water relationships of, uh, of crops so you can produce more crop per drop. And ANU is doing some great work on that and has done for a long time. Uh, there's also um, reduction in waste. And so a lot of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, are, are from waste. Uh, so that's wasted nitrogen in the system where it, you go into the denitrification cycle and produce nitrous oxide instead of being absorbed by the plant. There's also waste uh, on farm um, through crop losses and also waste in the food chain systems. Um, so that's the food loss and waste equation, which in some places is 30 to 40% of total production. And so, so tightening up of those food systems uh, and to support this, I think we need improved governance. And so um, when we go back to the work of Amartya Sen, uh, going back uh, now 50 years almost, uh, demonstrated quite conclusively that uh, the biophysical elements of famine were actually the minority. It's mostly about governance. And, and what we see globally is governance systems breaking down and, uh, and, and, and in some cases exaggerating and causing the problems rather than solving the problems. And so we need to pay as much attention to the governance side of things as we do the, to the biophysical. Alison, did you want to respond just in terms of just the underdone of the, of the climate? Yeah, I think it's completely correct, right? We, don't, we can use our current models and our current understanding of agricultural systems to make these projections into the future, but, but highly likely as, as things change and the, the temporal and spatial dynamics uh, bring this complexity and are likely to be underestimated. And, and Mark's point about governance being mm -hmm. elevated. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, completely. <laughs> we, we should have compared notes before. But yeah, I think this, the, the assuming all the solutions are going to come from the biophysical mitigation adaptation um, pathways is, is very unlikely. So the governance piece is, is, mm. is huge. And I think it's an opportunity, again, to kind of for more coming together of minds to understand how, you know, both of those together Will, will provide kind of greater solutions than, than either individually. Now I'll bring um, Sharon in here. Um, 
as you know, health and equity, and just so many questions flashed up in my head while watching Alison's um, presentation there. What, what is and, and what should Australia do to support global crop supply in the short, medium and long term? What, and what is Australia's obligation in promoting equity through regulation and trade? Mm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think Alison just demonstrated so beautifully uh, the... Sort of the contestation of values and interests that are at play in that uh, global food system uh, and, uh, and crops in particular. And within uh, a system like that where you have these incredible, and, and that is a governance challenge, when you have these uh, incredible contestations of values and of interests, where does equity land? when traditionally that's dominated by an economic productivity paradigm. And I would argue that for many, many years, our agricultural policy settings being absolutely driven by such a, a paradigm means that we don't consider some of those equity and wider, wider social and environmental issues. So vitally important for us here in Australia and uh, across the world is to think about what is the mission of agricultural policy? What is the mission of trade policy with agriculture, of course, vitally embedded within that? And if the mission is not, not simply about economic productivity and it's about environmental sustainability, it's about uh, the sorts of uh, access to healthy, nutritious food supplies, then it means we rethink the way uh, that we do agricultural policy, I would argue. I came from a meeting just immediately before this with uh, the, the, in the, there's a, a trade agreement that's currently under negotiation, the Australia-EU Free Trade Agreement. And it is so promising. There is a sustainable food systems chapter being negotiated within that trade agreement. And so many of the things that you were speaking about, Alison, were in those discussions. The conclusion has been reached with the New Zealand EU uh, trade agreement, which front and centre positions environmental sustainability, nutrition equity into uh, the, the, the chapter around sustainable uh, food systems and Australia is considering the same. So I take great hope from that. That's my glass half full. Uh, I'll come to the <laughs> glass half empty in a second. Um, but what it also begs us to ask, I think is, which you know, I think it was so lovely the way you demonstrated that, you know, that concentration of supply and of control who controls the seeds, who owns the seeds, who owns the intellectual property of the seeds. And that gets embedded within trade. You know, trade is, much of it is about intellectual property, intellectual property rights. And we know that part of the, the issues in terms of, of, of seeds is, and of, of global food supply, is about the control of seeds by the big agribusinesses. And so how, if we're thinking about an equitable food system, then really a regulatory question uh, has to be raised and has to be uh, tackled around the regulation of big, large transnational corporations in the global food system. And that is a political hot potato that we have constantly shied away from. So I think, I think what Alison's uh, talk, well, it really it inspired me in so many ways, uh, but that absolute essential conversation between technology, policy and politics is vital, is vital. It can't be a technology and then an add-on, what does it mean for policy? Because everything that Alison has pointed to is about policy coherence. How do the actions, so here in Australia, we have parts of uh, the communities across Australia who cannot access nutritious foods. 
not just in terms of food supply, but in terms of price, affordability, and of course, all of the marketing that goes with the crap food that's available. And so that's about you know, sort of the, uh, the acceptability, uh, the three A's uh, of the, the food supply. Why can they not access food? It's a food supply issue, so it's a food policy issue, but it's also a social policy issue. It's about the affordability, it's about the amount of money that people have in their pockets, and that's about social policy. So if we're going to think about an equitable, sustainable and healthy food system to address the sorts of issues uh, that Alison uh, has pointed towards and that Mark has uh, pointed towards, then we've got to tackle the issue of policy coherence as well. So great possibilities with trade right now, trade and investment be part of those discussions. Uh, and then you know, we, we don't even have a national food policy, for goodness sake. Let's get a food policy that creates an authorising environment for these sorts of issues. There's, a, there's an idea. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, to bring you into the conversation now, what about Australian science for international benefit? And I guess this all links up. How do we balance between strengthening local science for Australian benefit with local science for global benefit? Where should the international development focus be? There's, there's plenty of things to say about that, but if you allow me, I, yeah, I would be happy to make a few comments I'd about what yeah. was just said, including the right to uh, respectfully disagree. Um, so um, a, an interesting um, aspect of the discussion around policy is obviously crucial for all the issues we are discussing. Um, there's no doubt that the concentration in the trade area is a matter of great concern. Um, I think the focus on the concentration in the seed business is slightly exaggerated and misplaced from my experience, uh, in particular with regards to wheat, uh, because Alison and her team uh, produce international public good which find their way to farmers all around the world. And from direct uh, experience, uh, you actually travel to research centers in the global south, and there are literally dozens, if not maybe a hundred research facilities all around the world, which are actually developing the, the seeds from CIMIT. And the intellectual property embedded in this material is actually available free of charge. So the development of those varieties and their accessibility to farmers is not constrained by business. It is actually made more difficult to disseminate in the absence of business um, in many cases. Now, of course, all details matter in this instance. And, and the situation with hybrid crops like corn, maize, is, is different because farmers cannot replant their own seeds. And therefore, they have to buy them. However, observation of what's happened in Africa over the last 20 years and in Bangladesh, where I'm quite familiar with, and, and in northern India, the development of, and, and in places more, even more unlikely like Afghanistan, is that the development of the maize crop over the last two decades in these areas of the world, which is unprecedented in the displacement of one species by another, uh, has stirred the development of an industry um, which means farmers, even poor farmers, buy hybrid corn seeds. And, um, and so I think the idea that the concentration of the seed industry is an obstacle to the equitable dissemination of innovation is, to be blunt, a, a red herring. There are many other issues well, like of Sharon, uh... concentration. Now, that's about seed. Yeah. I want to provide an example of a sort of optimistic a view of what uh, Marx said about risk reducing investment. That's absolutely problematic that confronted to a risk of disease or climate, a farmer will be very conservative, avoid investing and result into low and stable yield. But in some cases, innovation can help. So the release about 10, 15 years ago of a flood tolerant rice variety by the International Rice Research Institute has been an extraordinary success of science, one of those things that we need to be aware of and, and celebrate. 
The only thing the variety dares is that when it's flooded up to 15 days, it doesn't die. And so if the flood recedes in time, the rice restarts and the crop is still there. Now, what Erie has observed is that although the variety that's tolerant is exactly the same as the previous one, the yield is exactly the same, the farmers planting the new variety have a higher yield. And that was unexpected. And the reason they have is because knowing it won't die if there's a flood, they actually look after it better. So they invest. And that investment results in higher crop, everything else being, being equal. So I won't take no, more no, time, but that, that was, yeah. I can talk about international cooperation, which is what we do all the time. And the two-way street where Australian science and international mm. science contribute so much to one another. There's plenty of example of that, Fantastic. obviously. But Sharon, did you want to respond? Just no. I mean, I, I'm I'm very happy to be wrong on that. I I suppose the the work that I'm uh, familiar with and that we look at within the the food systems and the inequities within the food systems as it relates to health. Not looking at the sort of the public access. Uh, to, to seeds programs, but really just looking at that concentrated control by people like Monsanto, for example. And what we saw, I mean, Alison, when you were given the example with the vaccines, uh, there were incredible um, regulatory shortcuts that were put in place that allowed the that still allowed the intellectual property protections within that process. And we don't have equitable access to vaccines uh, around the world. So I'm, I'm, uh, I, uh, I, we, we disagree. Uh, I think perhaps just the, the point for the discussion is being, being conscious of these different, different aspects uh, when we're thinking about the, sort of the global food system and the policy settings that get put in place that can either enable the sorts of things that you're speaking, more of what you're speaking about, Eric, rather than create some of the, the problems that, that I've been focusing on. So, and so there's a real possibility with this new trade agreement to actually do more of what you're speaking about and less of what I'm speaking about. So be at that table. And, and both Eric and Mark, and you can come on in on this. Um, Dr Bentley talked about the example of the COVID-19 vaccine development. Is that just thrown in a whole new sort of baseline now? Uh, this actually can be done when we need it to be done with that kind of cooperation. What, what do you think about using that as, a, as an example of okay. what, yeah. we're, what we're capable of doing? It's... I think there will be a lot to learn about COVID, okay? The next 20 years, there are hundreds of PhD will have to be written on <laughs> the differential response of countries, the different outcomes, you know, all sorts of things. Um, you can look at it in really two different ways. The, the successful development of mRNA vaccine was both an overnight miracle, but also the, the result of 20 years of unheralded, unknown, obscure work. So... Uh, you know, whether this can be replicated is, is a good question, but the funders of fundamental research in this place and in others should think very carefully what they don't fund today because it doesn't look like any prospect of any serious <laughs> economic benefit in, in light of unknown unknowns that can happen in the future. So that's the first point. The second point, which brings us back to this uh, distrust of corporations, is that the, the development of the vaccine by Pfizer did not involve any public funding except a, a guaranteed uh, client. There was a willing client ready to, play, ready to pay. Moderna was different. That they was Dolly Parton. So. <laughs> they, they received a very large <laughs> amount of public money to develop their vaccine. But there were differential models of development which show that there are multiple ways to get to the result. And we should remember that a third quite large corporation, CureVac, tried the same technology and failed. And, and then that probably a hundred initiatives to the same aim tried in good faith and, and failed. So I think there's a lot to learn there about the risk, about business investment, 
about path to markets, about the public-private partnership, about the role of fundamental research. There are many lessons of which I can't extract them all, but we need to have a nuanced view of those things. Yeah. Mark, did you want to... Look, I, I agree with some of the points that Eric's made, but I, I guess for me uh, a couple of key messages. One is that demonstrated the importance of, of science and, uh, and, and technology and data, um, but also demonstrating that that is not enough. Um, and so uh, in terms of COVID and the spread, it's clearly you need behavioural change, uh, you need structural change um, as well as uh, the, the science and technology uh, and and. To a large extent, uh, the um, the responses from COVID actually have, have resulted in partial behavioural change, but not the adequate structural change that drives the mm. the real future that where we need to be. Oh, it's fascinated yeah. with Alison saying the genomic testing centres mm -hmm. um, could perhaps be used now for a different reason. Um, yeah, and I think that's. I, I mean, we just need to to you know we need minds thinking about about these things. Um, you know, how can we deploy technology using infrastructures that are available at scale. Uh, but I also really like Eric's point about the, the landscape of fundamental research and the importance of science um, of the unknown unknowns. And I think, you know, everyone can write in their grant proposals now, you know, like in 20 years, you might, someone are going to need this, <laughs> right? Um, but I think that kind of the, you know, interesting to see governments kind of shifting from fundamental science to, to things that have to have an impact tomorrow or, or have to have like a really clear path to do something very tangible and, and the importance of really having this portfolio approach, having science on things that we might not ever need but we also might might be the thing that we, we mm. need at a certain time in the future. Yes, do you think, I mean, that is the perhaps the Pollyannish side of, of, a, of a terrible war of COVID, of, of climate change, that governments will actually take this kind of science seriously, look to it, because at the moment, you know, um, it's just the Gates Foundation, isn't it, mm -hmm. that will just commit long-term funding. It's very, very rare to that, get that kind of long-term funding. Will what we're going through at the moment perhaps be... I'm looking at you all. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Well, so I suppose in, in defence of health funding, so there's been uh, consistent funding uh, here in Australia, there's been consistent funding into medical research forever. There's not been consistent funding into prevention ever. Um, and what we've seen with COVID is the absolute necessity to have an understanding of both the biomedical alongside the social model of health. And because COVID has identified all of the, the social conditions that sit around uh, both our individual and the wider population health. So if I was going to, I, I, so I think it's been, I think there's been incredible investment in health research. And I, I do think uh, I do think COVID uh, has created a, a rupture into the investment uh, research investment world. Um, but I'm just going to make a plug for we actually need significantly more investment mm -hmm. into the uh, the quote unquote the softer side of all of that, uh, which mm -hmm. I think is what we're hearing loud and clear across all of our remarks today. Yeah. Mark, what do you think? Of a ten dollar lettuce might be a, a spike for governments to <laughs> iceberg lettuce. Oh, that, that, <laughs> We've that, got to take food seriously, actually. Yeah, cost um, of living. Yeah, look, I, 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 I think the response will differ very di much across different cultural groups, and uh, but I think one of the things that it's shown us, and, and Alison brought this out, is the fragility of some of our systems. So where we have um, just-in-time systems. Uh, with long and fragile supply chains, uh, in a sense, we're asking for trouble, and uh, and so I think some of the big corporations have actually realised that they've they've overdone the efficiency um, side of things, and they need to step back and, and look at the robustness side of things a bit more. Mm. So I think that will actually drive some change. 
Um, but the bigger change, I think, is actually cultural within our populations. And we've become so used to, you know, low cost, just in time uh, sort of uh, product um, uh, that, that there's an addiction element there and, and weaning people off the addiction is going to be tough. Mm. And, uh, and the best way of doing that is actually giving people better alternatives and uh, and at the moment, I don't see that in our discourse here in Australia. Yeah. That, that contrast yeah. you had of the, you know, <coughs> click of the button, everything's mm -hmm. delivered, and then you're talking about in Africa, you know, mixing flour, um, mm -hmm. wheat flour now with sorghum, and, and I thought, gosh, you know, the contrast there between what we have and what other people don't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think the, the just-in-time model ha has really kind of gone... Too far, you know, and, and our our addiction to, to trade, I, I guess, is at the high level, you know, not just, you know, our consumer goods that we really like to have delivered tomorrow to our, our houses, but also our, our global commodities, right, where we've become highly reliant on, on being able to just have those available just in time when we need them. Yeah, and I think it just sort of reminds us of... Um, so the, the foods that we've been speaking about uh, really in the context of hunger or of, of undernutrition, uh, uh, at the same time, we have a global epidemic of over, well, not over nutrition, just of uh, rubbish. Uh, and so with that, you uh, incredible levels of obesity, of non-communicable diseases uh, that's associated with the consumption of really... Uh, unhealthy, not nutritious foods. And what we've seen, so whilst all of all of what's been, uh, as Alison described, what we've seen, and I don't want to sound anti-business, I'm looking at Eric, I'm not anti-business, <laughs> but I am very mindful of how some of the, the large corporations operate, because what we did see was a massive entry, even a ramping up of entry into the market of the corporations who supply high fat, high salt and high sugar. And we will see coming out of uh, COVID a tsunami of non-communicable diseases as a consequence of that analysis that was done across Europe has shown uh, this absolute addiction to uh, Uber Eats, those mm -hmm. types, uh, because you know, COVID, we were locked down, we were all ordering online. So for those sorts of commodities, they became uh, much, much more easily accessible. So we've got this double whammy of the, the problems of the, the global and, and the national food system. And here in Australia, that's our problem, is the absolute easy access and affordability of high fat, high salt, high sugar junk food sitting alongside a $10 lettuce. It's a very rational decision to buy the cheaper per calorie uh, product, which is not the $10 lettuce. I did buy it this week, the $10 lettuce, that is. <laughs> let me open it up now to the, um, I just couldn't resist it. Um, let me open up now to the audience and we've got about um, 15 minutes for questions. Are we, oh, thank you so much. And our really lovely um, staff will get the mic for you. Have Yes, here. Um, thank you so much. Or you can use your... Um, outside voice, you know. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, firstly, congratulations to the panel. I love when there's a bit of controversy, right? So that's got to be like... And they're civil about modus it. ...modus operandi. Let's do that a bit more. And I think um, we disagree less than we look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's super. Um, and then, Alison, if you went to Hurlston, we'll have notes to compare, and if you went to James Roos, we won't have so much to talk about. Um, so, but I want to turn to investment, right? It's sort of been touched on. But what we know in, in the agricultural space, I reckon, is that we invest far too much in crops and we invest far too much in technologies around crops. And those other areas are really missing out. Social, environment, um, some of the forgotten areas um, that are, contribute to a nutritious diet. And the FAO has just come out and said, yes, 828 million um, people in hunger but 3.1 billion people can't afford a nutritious diet. How do we change the investment paradigm that is, that's the fundamental bit. Yes, policy, governance, all that kind of stuff. But the, the investment paradigm is what's got to be changed 
to drive the innovations that are going to resolve these situations in future food systems. So how do we change that? Yeah, big, big question. And I think very, I mean, if I look at the... We're going to have the fight of the Sydney uh, <laughs> ag plot soon. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if I, if I look at the global wheat program at CIMIT, we're 50 biophysical scientists and, and two social scientists. Um, and, and then we look, we say, okay, we want to make a real impact on consumers and value chains, markets and value chains. And we're going to do that from genetics. We're going to say, let's, here's the best of the genetics. And, and if we just make good varieties, people will grow them and that will solve everything. Um, but I, and I think that really demonstrates that, that disconnect between, okay, maybe really you should start with the consumer or the farmer. What do they want? What do they need? And for that, we need very different skills. We need to understand the, the socioeconomic context um, and, and understand, you know, what are the drivers of people's decision making uh, and, and go back from that and design the biology. Um, so, you know, as a plant breeder, I'm kind of to say, you know, you, we need to take the money out of the plant breeding and, and into the, the kind of socioeconomic space. Um, I'm probably not going to say that on record, but we really need to, 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 to balance those things, to have kind of an understanding of that, those full factors. And I think ACI has done some, some interesting, you know, new investments, investing in behavior, you know, more in the behavioral, understanding the behavioral changes that lead to an intervention in develop in the development context, becoming you know being taken up and actually kind of becoming um, more widespread in the system, rather than relying on our kind of model as biologists of you know sort out the biology and then it will you know it will be so good it will just go through through the system. Um, and I'm sure maybe uh, Eric and Sharon probably have comments on on kind of that achieving that that rebalance. Well, let me go to Sharon and then Eric. Yeah. Um, it, it, so I'm going to sound really uh, alarmist and, and negative uh, in this space uh, because I think investment is where the game is at. Uh, but I'm thinking particularly about the sort of the, the private, the venture capitalists and the, the private money. Um, and in some of the work we're doing, we're looking at the financialization uh, of the global food system and how three of the world's largest money managers, uh, BlackRock, State Street, and, and I always forget the other one, but there's the three of them. Uh, that one, um, <laughs> the Vanguard, uh, have significant shares in the global agri-business world and in the global fossil fuel uh, world. And so you imagine really being able to influence the venture capitalists and of course, we're seeing a shift starting to to say, to do the sorts of investment that you're speaking about. Um, and I think we're starting to see some of that, although well, it depends what you read, but um, you know, some literature will show how, you know, on one hand, the, the, the positioning, the performance that comes from those money managers into the agri-business world would be very supportive of this sort of discussion and at the same time they're still not requiring any uh, of the companies that they invest into to do anything about fossil fuels and particularly around uh, emissions from coal so you've got this well sort of schizophrenic uh, thing happening but I think there's movement in there and again I would say be for people concerned about these sorts of issues be at those tables having these sorts of uh, discussions uh, within that that level of, sort of private investment is where it's really happening, I think. Um, we'll go to Eric. Yeah. I mean, only if three I, years no, ago, no, um, if, our, our weekends were going to be ruined I, because if, our youth If I take gonna... it just at the, <laughs> the opposite level, which is the investment at the farm uh, level, um, I think we may, uh, and I, I work towards that, and, and we, we hope that we may see some shifts in crops which go in that direction. For example, the recent interest in pulses, uh, you know, more legumes being grown. Now, there's a very complex set of influences, drivers that go toward, towards this, but that could translate into farmers investing in growing pulses when in the past they wouldn't have had because 
the return would not be good enough. And, and so that, that then we'll go to those corporations and give them something to work towards. Um, and that requires some of us to do some innovation, including technical innovation. But before that, there are lots of other policy aspects which are very intractable problem in, in parts of the world. For example, in South Asia, where most of the poor people live and most of the hungry people live still today, um, the, the government's schemes, uh, subsidy schemes to agriculture are so distorted, outdated, cause so much perverse effects and problems and are completely politically impossible to dismantle that I guess you, you experience the same. Some of us believe that, that you know, too hard basket and we just keep breathing. <laughs> Mark, yeah. I, I think, and I'm, I have to preface my response by saying I'm not an expert in this area, but sort of with an overview of it. Uh, there, there's a couple of things here. One, one is the total quanta of R&D that applies to agriculture and food, and that's been shrinking. And uh, and so so that that's the first point. Uh, so we've got, uh, you know, recognisably increasing problems with supply, demand and variability that Alison was talking about, uh, but less investment. And that's not a particularly rational thing to do. And so at the same time, we've got uh, the, the trade-offs that uh, um, um, uh, we talked about before. Um, uh, are actually increasing in their their obviousness. So uh, you can't produce extra food um, in the face of restrictive water, um, in the face of wanting to have good biodiversity, in the face of expansion of cities, uh, which often are on good land and similar things. So we're we're coming to the point where all of our choices are increasing, have increasing trade-offs. And so um, one of the ways through that is by increased innovation and, and investment in that, and we're, la we're lacking on that. So we need to fix up the, the quanta thing first. Secondly, there's, a, there's an element of, of um, uh, self-attraction of, of the funding. So when you have a big industry, such as the wheat industry, um, it attracts scientists um, you know, for career reasons, it attracts additional funding, so it grows bigger and bigger. And so of that shrinking pie, you get bigger slices of the commodities, essentially, which means that the other things start to shrink in, in absolute terms as well as relative terms. So that's the orphan crops. And so at least CG has a program on the orphan crops. Uh, but broadly, um, the, the forces which generate the expansion of the big ones also press down on the little ones, all of the diversification factors which provide market niches or nutraceuticals or, you know, um, uh, good food um, types in stressful situations. And so all of those things are being pushed down. And at the same time, I think the points that um, uh, Sharon's made about, uh, you know, the, the food poverty issues in rich countries or even food poverty issues in the houses where someone's really well-fed and someone isn't well-fed. And so, so that sort of multi-scalar issue uh, has to be addressed by a combination of, of good social science and good policy development. And again, I don't see that being well integrated into um, the broader conversations about agriculture and food. And, and just to give you some view that this is not the <laughs> this is not just the domain of of um, the agricultural sort of province. Uh, if you look at climate change, of the global investment in climate change, virtually all of it goes into the big ticket items like the satellites and the um, oceanographic buoys and things like that and the big supercomputers. And sure, we we need those sorts of things. But it's something like about 95 to 98 percent of the investment globally. Part of the rest of it goes to the climate adaptation stuff, the things that really matter to people, and a tiny, tiny fraction of that goes to the social science, which actually connects that science with those people who actually need the science. So we've got big, big problems in how we run our science. So, so that's where I mentioned the governance side of things is really, really important. If we miss that, we miss solving the big problems. Out of work. Yeah. Mm. Um, another question. From the back there, thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for your talks. Two quick points. Um, Eric made the first one about the, um, the importance of moving to pulses, I think. I mean, that makes climate change sense um, as we move our protein sources from animals to plants. It makes some fertiliser sense, of course. It, it may require cultural changes and challenges, but we know in Australia we've got some very robust, resilient, rugged pulses that aren't very palatable, but the research could be going into making those more palatable. So um, the, that, the second point is, Alison is talking about 
international policy and, and multinational agreements on food security. It seems to me that all of that requires some sort of agreement on population size. Um, all the efforts will be cut short if if, if, the, if, if the, um, the population is not somehow controlled in a, in a, a, a sort of a, a gentle, meaningful and responsible way. <laughs> you want to take that? I mean, uh, Norman Borlaug, well, uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner, I mean, talked about the, the population monster and the need to, to look at that alongside side food security. So I think there's, there's no no debate that, that that's that the things are interconnected uh, i think obviously hugely complex to to have those those dialogues um even complex to have the dialogues about whose responsibility is global food security so i mean we're really a long way away from those um the point where we can have those those discussions i i think you know we the un did reach a deal on exporting grain from from ukraine which was a, a major breakthrough um, but you know that we're at that level. Um, I, I think whose the, responsibility is it? Whose responsibility is to to have to do that? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I guess that's the big question, right? Yeah. Who who's going to do it? Who who should who should do that? Who is the is it a United Nations convening mm. power um, to be able to do that? When at the moment we don't have market assurances, market controls, uh, any agreements on on. You know, Australia could feed all of their their bumper yield to, to pigs. No, you know that's that's there's no there's no framework mm. for for preventing that. Um, so, very big question. <laughs> Huge. Did anyone? Else? Can I can, yeah, can I say Eric, something please. about population? Yeah, I I, I hate to uh, look like the optimist which says don't worry, it will sort itself out. But let's just look at what actually is happening in the world. Uh, in, in real life, the population growth is slowing down. Um, it's often slowing down, it's always slowing down in connection to one of the most robust indicator is uh, girls' attendance to school and female literacy. And apparently it explains all the movement. It's often correlated to the economic development. Um, and there are uh, case studies to, to, um, to uh, learn from. So Bangladesh, and which was East Pakistan until 1971, has actually managed to control its population pretty much, the, getting there anyway, whereas Pakistan hasn't. And they were the same country only 50 years ago. And they are culturally very, very different. One is Bengal, OK, and the other Urdu. Um, Nevertheless, there's something to learn there. I'm not sure the United Nations can go and tell people that they should have less children, but certainly getting people out of poverty is a way to get people to have fewer children. And there is an argument that there are certain people who use an awful lot of resources. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> that, yeah. that may be more the That's, problem than that. Yeah, yeah, we haven't gone there yet. Yeah. <laughs> Flying people to the moon yeah. and that sort of thing. Mark, did you want to respond at all to... Oh. Oh, no, look, I very much agree. Um, so okay. the best contraceptives are education, wealth, and uh, female Educating reproductive girls, rights. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and you do that and solve the problem. Fantastic. Look, I think we're probably at the time. Owen, do you want me to knock it off? <laughs> oh, you want to take one more question? One more question. Who's got a question? Oh, we've got... I can't choose, so... <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, Maybe quick on back to the investment point, like uh, Alison, you had three kind of sh short, medium and long term pillars. And that seemed address investment was like on the last square and uh, diversity and resilience. You know, so how are we going to address how can we make any progress on the short term goals if we don't address those long term goals? That's my question. Yeah, exactly. And I think in that in that context, the, the long term term goal is to have long term investment and I think it's just acknowledging that that getting that in the short term <laughs> is problematic um, but really we need to see the I, I think we need to see the investment portfolio move from you know very short term you know political cycles to to these sustained commitments that that allow us to address things in the short and medium but with a longer time horizon um, as well. So, so I think 
it's a, it's a, a long term aspiration that we have a recognition that that these kind of resilience or preventative food and agriculture as preventative medicine uh, requires a sustained investment over over a long period of time. So it, it's it's definitely not to reflect that having that in place in the short term is is a priority, but I think the reality is it'll take a longer time until we we kind of finally accept that and and get to that point. Any other responses to that? Sharon. Can I just, I suppose, I've been positive for a change, um, but being positive. Um, so just within the UN, there's uh, increasing attention being given to what's been referred to as the mission economy. I spoke about mission a wee while ago. Um, and I and I see that being picked up. It's been picked up in the environmental space. It's been picked up in the the investment uh, space. It's been spoken about, you know, the World Economic Forum. If we pay any attention to that, so and the the idea of the mission economy is that exactly that sort of point of what's the long term uh, objective that we're trying to work towards, and then working out that portfolio or that combination of approaches to get there, recognising, you know, if we think COVID has created the rupture that it could be, recognising that the short termism has been uh, one of the, the, so the sort of the new public management model that's been adopted wholeheartedly in uh, high income countries and exported to low and middle income countries has failed because it's been based on short term efficiency. So I, I take comfort from that. The World Health Organization is currently uh, embedding a mission approach to its work. And that I think that you know, that's coming from the highest levels of the UN. So you know, we need a whole other session about the role of the UN. Uh, but uh, I, I'd see some positive uh, signals starting to come through there. Okay. Can, I, can I just uh, uh, remind uh, ourselves. So the, the inequity of the COVID vaccination is hard to, um, to uh, contest in, in, in one way. But in, uh, on the other hand, if three years ago we would have said that planet Earth had the capacity to vaccinate half of its population in 18 months, 3 billion people, 12 billion doses, I mean, who would have believed that, that the international system managed to vaccinate 1 billion rich and 2 billion poor, leaving four on, on, the, on the side, which is a problem, which is, you know, whether it's, it, it may not be good enough, but not reflecting on the fact that we've achieved that. I, I was a young adult at the beginning of the AIDS epidemics, and I witnessed the development of the antiretroviral and all that therapeutics and how long it took to get equitable access of these drugs to the people who really needed them. And having observed as an older adult that success, it, it, it may not be good enough, but we can't completely discount that we've achieved that, we, which I think we, we should uh, sort of, you know, think about it. And, and the, exactly as you said, the, the, the Ukraine has been, we've managed to restart the exports, which again, three months ago, I actually made a bet that we would, uh, but that was, you, you know, a, 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 an act of faith. But the system has managed. I think that probably brings us, did anyone else? Um, Owen, did you want to? Okay, look, I think... Is there any take-home message? I mean, do we take Eric's hope and yeah. um, do, we, so. that's, do we leave it there? Exactly. Mark, <laughs> did you, any take-home message? Yeah. Or? Uh, well, well, yeah, you've got to have hope, but you actually have to have hope is not just blind. Uh, you actually have to have some basis for hope. And, and that, that is, I think, about uh, our ability as a species to be innovative, to actually organise things in ways which actually benefit the majority eventually, maybe not initially, uh, and to actually um, start moving towards a more equitable distribution of, of wealth and wellbeing. Perhaps we could share. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Look, um, this is amazing. And, Owen, does that mean you're popping up? Just say. Uh, in a second. 
Okay. Um, look, this, I think, um, SEAT is an amazing example of, within this university of what can be done, and it's really fantastic that Dr Alison Bennett is, um, Bentley is a um, uh, fellow and wonderful to absolutely have you here. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, as I said, inspiring to hear you speak. So thanks so much to Dr Alison Bentley and also thanks to our incredible panel, to um, Dr Eric Hutner, to Professor Mark Howden, Professor Sharon Friel. Give them a big thank you. And I would like to thank um, uh, Professor Owen Atkin and his team at SEAT for doing this vital and fascinating work. And there will be um, some drinks and refreshments afterwards, so a lot more time to chat as well. But um, I think Owen is just going to leave us with, with some words. There's one thing I just wanted to say, and that, look, in, in some ways there's a focus there just at the very end in terms of the SEAT, but SEAT, I want to just point out, is a community component that's emerged from many folk that are in this room. It's interesting, if you look at the title of it, it's agri-technology, it was very narrow in its focus and that actually reflected a journey that I think that many of us were on. It came out of plant sciences, agriculture, it was coming out of a very crop-centric sort of perspective about what could be, but it was interesting over the last three years how it has evolved. We've sort of realised that the potential is to deal with agri-sector challenges, big societal challenges, and it's actually therefore branching right into across to the whole university. We've heard a lot about social policy, regulatory space and so on. So don't be fooled by the title of the name of the centre as an innovation institute, because I think in many ways what the offering here is, is around the way in which the university can harness its full capabilities to deal with all of these issues. And the mission space, which is a really important one for us, which is what we think is a real opportunity, is the way universities more broadly across the country can use their full interdisciplinary capabilities to deal with these big challenges, define the outcome, assemble the teams and get on with it, right? So, and I think that could underpin some of the R&D deficiency that's occurring and so on. So I think the journey that we've gone on ourselves is reflected in now this breadth of conversation that was here today. So thank you very much to everyone. And last thing I just want to say is there's an awesome team of people that make this sort of thing happen. So the SEAT team and everyone else that's associated with it, thank you very much. And also all those for who have been involved in the building of SEAT over the last few years, thank you for coming today and also for all the work you've done.